In this session, we will ask the question, what's the relationship between prayer and living in the the last days? The end of all things is at hand. We spent a whole session on what that means. We're living in the last days. The time is short because the judge is standing at the door The Messiah has already come. He's brought with him the kingdom of God. We live between the first and second coming. These are days of the mysterious arrival of the kingdom. And we have tasted the powers of the age to come. And we are awaiting the second coming with a sense of urgency and joy. What's the relationship between prayer and and the end of all things. And the way we're going to go about answering that question is uh, first by looking at Peter's logic, as we so often do with the word therefore. And secondly, we're going to look at what I'm going to call uh, reality, or let's just call it a reality check. Go beyond formal or external structural logic to reality itself. So, Father, as we as we look at the very wording and stream of thought and logic that your apostle has used to relate prayer to the last days, and as we look at the reality of how he does it, I pray that we would become praying people. Make us, I pray, sober-minded, self-controlled, for the sake of of prayer. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So the connection between the end of all things being at hand and prayer is therefore. So there's something about the end of all things being the place where we are, and the necessity of prayer. So the first thing I want to do then is ask, what is it about this time where we live that would make prayer so urgent? And before you run off anywhere else, let's just keep reading for a few verses, and I think it's 10 verses later, verse 17, Chapter 4, you read this. It is time for the judgment to begin with the household of God. That's us. That's us Christians. It's time for judgment to begin with us. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous, that's us, is scarcely saved. What will become of the ungodly and sinner? So the whole point there is to say we live in a time of great crisis, urgency. Judgment has begun in this age with the coming of Jesus. Judgment has arrived, and it begins with us, not punitively, as though he's going to punish us, but uh, in a purifying way, as chapter 1, verse 7 says, that we are uh, going through various trials, fiery trials, so that the genuineness of our faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, might redound to praise and glory and honor. So the, the judgment of God in these last days is directed toward the household of God, towards us, towards the righteous, not to condemn us or destroy us, but to purify us. And for those who will not have it as purifying, it will become punishment. So prayer here is because this end of all things being at hand is a very urgent and crisis and dangerous and difficult time, like Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 1, understand this, that the that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. And these difficulties are a great 
assault on our faith. I mean, life in this age is always embattled. There is war against our soul. But as the last days draw to a close, it will become increasingly difficult. Peter knows this, and therefore he's saying, pray, pray. In fact, you can see the connection and now I am going beyond First Peter. So one, once I established that there's a connection between the end times and prayer, and I saw that the end times are a time of, of judgment and crisis and difficulty, now I want to go looking elsewhere in the New Testament for some illumination of how prayer works in that regard. And, and I find Jesus saying, stay awake at all times praying that you may have strength to escape these things, the things that he's predicted that are going to cause the church suffering, escape these things that are going to take place and stand before the Son of God. So pray for strength. It will take strength not to be ruined and sucked in and destroyed, but rather escape the spiritual destruction of the things that are coming the way he put it in his own battle in Gethsemane and used it to apply to us. Watch and pray. Pray that you may not enter into temptation, not be sucked into and destroyed by it, but escape it. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is so weak, hence the need for prayer. So, there's the connection. The end of all things is at hand. It's a time of, of judgment and crisis and difficulty and great spiritual warfare and all the more than the need for us to call on God for all the help we need. Which leads us now to this. Why didn't he just say, therefore, pray? Why did he say, therefore, be self-controlled and be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers? And wouldn't the answer be, there is a mindset that prays and there's a mindset that thinks prayer is pointless. And he's pleading with us to look at the reality of the world around us and get the mindset that praise. And what I, mean, what I mean by reality check is pause over these words and don't just say them. Dig into them. Ask, what's the reality of being self-controlled? What's the reality of being sober? And so the, the fruit of my reflection there is that being self-controlled means not... Um, carried along by impulse, impulse, but rather carried along by what? Well, by reflecting, not just carried along by impulse, but reflecting on the nature of, of reality that's in front of us and then bringing our, ourselves in a controlled way into alignment with reality. Right? So self-control is going to avoid the, the folly of being just swept along by external or internal impulses, but gets control so that we're not controlled by those, but controlled by a true assessment of what really is, namely what, what are the last things that he has really already described for us, or we've seen later in the verses. And, and then sober-minded, it's really it's just sober. This is the, the image, the metaphor. The opposite is drunk. So you ponder, what does drunk mean? Well, drunk means you can't see things for what they really are, and you can't act in a way that is appropriate. You wobble all over the place. So you can't drive through reality. You're going to hurt somebody or yourself. Don't, don't, be, don't have a mind that can't see straight, can't act straight. So in a sense, self-controlled and sober-minded are saying the same thing. See reality for what it is and bring your lives into conformity with reality, which means you will pray if you have a mind that is in touch with reality.